Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a little bit of a shorter one and it's different than the cases that I normally cover, but I definitely wanted to cover it and share Elias's story because he truly died being a hero. This case also serves as a lesson to those of us who meet people online and maybe don't realize the dangers that come with that. Violence can happen at the hands of men or women and against men or women, and this case is an example of that. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Albert. Some of you may know that I've been using Albert for quite some time now, and it's for a good reason. Albert is completely different than any bank account you've ever used, which is why I love them. Traditional banks can be such a headache. They can charge $35 plus for overdraft fees, which has happened to me so many times, more than I would like to admit, but it's frustrating every time it happens. And a lot of times, banks will charge you just for storing your money in their bank. But Albert is different. Albert actually helps you save money. You sign up for free, and it's so easy to sign up. Albert can help you by looking at your income and your expenses and sees what money you have to save, and then it automatically moves it into your savings account, sometimes only being a couple dollars at a time. Like I said, I've been using this feature for quite some time, and you'd be surprised at how much money you can save without putting in any effort. Like I just said, I've been using this feature for quite some time. I've actually been saving little bits over the course of about a year or so for an upcoming vacation, and it literally just felt like one day I had all this money sitting there in my account ready for me to use for my vacation because I put literally no effort into saving it. But even beyond just saving and managing your money, you can get up to $250 whenever you need it, hitting your bank account within minutes with absolutely no overdraft fees. They will spot you up to $250 by advancing it from your next paycheck and then you pay it back with no interest and no credit check. When you download the Albert app, you will find out exactly how much you qualify for. Plus, you can get 5 to 20% back on purchases that you're already making when you swipe your debit card at places like Walmart or Starbucks and you'll see that money showing up in your account immediately. Who doesn't want free money on purchases that they're already making? The other cool feature that Albert has is Genius. If you're anything like me and maybe you don't really know how to budget, managing money can really suck, but they have a team of financial experts that they call their geniuses that will look at your situation and help you make a plan, and then they're available to answer any questions that you may have if you do get stuck. I'm so excited about the offer that Albert has for my subscribers. If you open an account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll get $150. So make sure you click link down below and head over to albert.com slash Rachel Shannon and download the Albert app today. That's albert.com slash Rachel Shannon. If you open a bank account and you connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll get $150. Thank you again so much to Albert for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of my channel. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Elias Otero. Elias Otero was born on November 19, 1999 to parents Luis and Alicia Otero. He had two brothers, Jacob and Nicholas, and two sisters, Delilah and Elia, and he was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time of his death. Elias was described as having a great sense of humor and was always trying to get everyone around him to laugh, and his favorite colors were red and black. He was kind and compassionate towards those around him, and he was very protective over those he loved. His family was described as very close to one another. Elias had completed a program at the Department of Corrections and then went on to become an officer for the Metropolitan Detention Center. At the time, he was also engaged and he was excited to get married. He was living on his own with his fiance and he was planning for his future. So Elias's brother, Nicholas, was 20 years old at the time that this all happened. Nicholas had met a woman online speaking for a couple of days over Snapchat, and he was really excited to get to know her and to see where the relationship between them could go. I don't think he knew her real name at this time because he had just met her over Snapchat. He pretty much only knew her as her Snapchat username, which was ShortyXAnna, so it can pretty much be assumed that her name was Anna. So when she asked to meet up with Nicholas on the early morning hours or the late night, I guess, of February 11th, 2021, he was really excited excited. Over Snapchat, she had asked Nicholas to pick her up from her home and then bring her near Alavadro Park. So at around 2 a.m., he stopped at her house, driving his 2003 red Lexus convertible, and the two headed over to the park. However, it was never actually Anna's plan to hang out with Nicholas that night. 
Nicholas started to get the feeling that maybe Anna didn't have the best intentions because she kept asking him about the necklace that he was wearing. He said that he had been wearing a diamond encrusted necklace and she made it a point to continuously compliment it. She had also asked him where he kept his cash and if he kept a gun in the car. Then after that, as they were still driving but getting near the park, Nicholas noticed that Anna had secretly called someone and then put her phone under her leg so that Nicholas wouldn't be able to see it and he realized that she had been letting this person listen in on their conversation this entire time. He realized that this may actually be a setup, so he told Anna that he wanted to leave and he started putting up his convertible top. However, once they actually got to the park, Nicholas saw a car drive up behind them and then Nicholas watched as three armed men got out of the car. Nicholas described the first male as being a white or light-skinned Hispanic, being between the ages of 19 and 20 years old, standing at 5 feet 7 inches tall, and he was holding a handgun. The other was an African-American male between 19 and 20, and he was between 6 feet and 6 feet 4 inches tall, and he was holding a micro Draco. Then the last man was a Hispanic male, also between the ages of 19 and 20, and this man had a rifle. He said that all of these men were wearing materials around their heads and face like robes, and they were all wearing gloves as well as hooded sweatshirts. After these three men got out, they forcibly removed Nicholas from his car, one of the men grabbing his shoulders and the other one grabbing his feet. He tried to get a look at his attackers, but as he did so, one of them hit him in the head with their gun and told him not to look at them. They then threw him to the ground on the dirt and gravel and then dragged him until they reached a grassy area. One of these men, who Nicholas referred to as the crazy one, had held a gun to Nicholas's head as they were in the grassy area. And according to Nicholas, he was begging the other men to let him shoot Nicholas while the other individuals searched through Nicholas's car. Then the men stripped down Nicholas, took all of his credit cards and his jewelry and everything else that he had on him. They also searched the trunk of his car to see if he had a gun in there. And I don't believe they ended up finding it because he did own a gun, but I don't think it was in the car. They also took some cash out of his center council. As all of this was happening, one of the men actually shot off around near Nicholas's head, but it didn't actually hit him. Instead, the bullet went into the grass next to him. But even after all of this, even after stripping Nicholas down and searching his entire car and taking everything that he had, including his cards, jewelry, and whatever amount of cash that Nicholas had on him, this was not enough for the robbers they wanted more. So one of these men forced Nicholas to get into the passenger seat of his red Lexus, and then this man got into the driver's seat of the car. He then saw Anna getting into the silver four-door sedan that the three men had originally arrived in. Then the two other men that were with them had gotten into the back seat of the Lexus and they held a gun to Nicholas's head. So they started driving and they forced Nicholas to give them directions to the family home. So that is where they went with the silver car and Anna driving following it closely behind them. Now, Elias had actually been over at the family home visiting that day when he received a FaceTime call from his brother. When he answered the call, he saw that his brother Nicholas was being held at gunpoint. They were holding an AK-47 to his head, and Nicholas had told Elias that he was being held hostage and that he had to come out and pay a ransom for his safe return. The robbers forced Nicholas to beg his brother Elias to bring $1,000 out of the house as well as a gun for them to use. As this was happening, they continued to drive towards the home, which was located on the 450 block of Timothy Southwest. When they got there, 24-year-old Elias walked out of the house holding a weapon of his own, which he did own legally. Along with Elias, their brother Jacob, as well as Jacob's girlfriend, also walked outside with him. Elias then started walking towards the Lexus with his gun, and he saw that his brother was being held at gunpoint. As Elias walked closer to the car, the driver yelled, don't try no funny shit or I will blow your head off. But Elias aimed his gun at the driver and told him to let his brother go. But as soon as he did this, the driver opened fire and he shot Elias five times. As soon as he fired these shots, Elias fell to the ground. So the driver immediately fled, still driving the red Lexus with Nicholas inside. But after driving a couple of blocks, Nicholas did find an opportunity to escape. He actually managed to jump out of the car as the driver was making a turn. According to phone records that police would later obtain from Nicholas's phone, as all of this was happening at 2.31 a.m., Anna had texted Nicholas and said, are you okay? I'm still running. IDK, where to go? But Nicholas was not buying any of this. 
He knew that the specific items that these robbers were looking for were things that he had only told Anna about, so he knew that Anna was the one who set up this entire thing. However, by 2.20 a.m. on February 11th, Nicholas and Elias' sister called 911 to report that Elias had been shot. When police arrived, they saw that Elias was still laying in the middle of the street in front of their home. And unfortunately, he was pronounced dead at the scene. He died trying to save his brother and being the protector that his family always knew he was. Near Elias's body, police found three pistols and a rifle. Once again, the family members told police about how there were three armed men who had arrived at their house with Nicholas in his Lexus with someone else driving it. Then they mentioned this four-door silver sedan that was following close behind them that had also arrived on the scene. They reported to police that one of the robbers had shot Elias as he was coming out of the home. Then police went and searched the area and pretty quickly they actually found Nicholas's car which had been wrecked and still running and it was abandoned about two blocks away from the Otero home. So of course, after this, police started their investigation into trying to figure out who these hijackers were. So using the Snapchat name that Nicholas had showed the police, they were able to search up her username on Facebook to see if they could find a match. Again, at this point, nobody knew her real name other than it being Anna because it was in her username username. So by using this, police actually found a Facebook page that provided the same Snapchat name in their profile. This search led police to finding an 18-year-old female named Anna Dukes. Nicholas then gave police the phone number that the two had used to text back and forth on the day that he actually picked her up, and police were able to use this to connect her Snapchat and her Facebook accounts, so they all linked together as being the same person. So then also using her phone number, police were able to track her phone pings from that night which showed her movements. They were able to track her phone to the park that Nicholas was at that night and then to the Otero home and then back to her own residence. Then police were also able to actually log into her Snapchat and see all of the activity on her Snapchat account on the day that this all occurred and then the days leading up. It turned out that Anna had been chatting with another man on the night before or just a couple of hours before the situation with Nicholas. She had also carjacked this guy after setting up a date with him. The robbers then used this man's car when they robbed Nicholas and murdered Elias. So in that situation, she had basically done the same exact thing. She had contacted a man named Richard through a Snapchat who ultimately agreed to pick her up for a date or a hookup or whatever you want to call it. Either way, he picked up Anna and they went to the same park, El Vajro Park. But shortly after they met up, 911 received a phone call at 11.42 p.m. on February 10th to report that he had just been carjacked by two Hispanic males with guns. This took place pretty much right after they arrived to the park. Then, just a few hours later, at 2 a.m. on February 11th, they did the same thing to Nicholas. But for the time being, police were unable to locate Anna or anybody else involved in this. But they were able to identify one of the other men who were involved with the shooting and the one who was actually responsible for murdering Elias. This man was Anna's 17-year-old boyfriend, Adrian Avila. So they released warrants that named both 18-year-old Annabella Dukes and 17-year-old Adrian Avila as suspects in Elias's murder. They also mentioned the other carjackings in this warrant. They had also released a description of the 2000 model silver sedan, which they were able to view from a neighbor's surveillance video. It also turned out that Adrian probably was connected to another murder before this took place in 2020. So Anna's phone had pinged at the address of 2609 John Street Southeast the same night of Nicholas's robbery and Elias's murder. This address was very familiar to police because there had been a homicide investigation that took place at that address and Adrian had been identified as an involved party earlier, but I don't really know what came of this investigation. Clearly, Adrian wasn't in jail, so don't really know what happened with that. Then after identifying Adrian, they were also able to get a hold of his cell phone data to track his cell phone pings. And once again, his cell phone pinged at his residence and then at the park and then at the Otero residence and then back at his residence. They were also able to find extensive communication between Anna and Adrian, which literally laid out the plans that they had to rob Nicholas. They had also found messages between Anna and another man named Damien, who may have also been involved in the carjacking 
but I don't believe police were able to find out what his last name is yet. Either way, when police read the messages between these two, it showed a little bit more of the plan that they wanted to carry out. Anna was talking about how the other men should point a gun at her head too. She said that she would run away acting all scared so that she wasn't suspected as being involved. She said that she was going to give her items to these men to make it look as real as possible, but then she also talked about how she was getting scared of this robbery. She told this person how she contacted everybody that she loved just in case. These messages showed that she started to realize just how serious this all was about to be. So closer to the actual robbery, she had started texting another friend about how scared she really was. She was saying things like, you don't know how bad this was, it's getting really bad. So clearly, she was starting to have some second thoughts about the men that she was dealing with. Then in another conversation that police were able to uncover between Anna and Adrian, she basically said to Adrian, you better have my back, I'm not playing, I've had your back in so many other situations. All of this showed the very clear planning, premeditation, and clear understanding that all of this may result in gunfire. And to me, this is just my opinion, but it seems like Adrian is a psycho who literally just wanted to kill someone, based on what Nicholas said about him screaming and begging the others to let him shoot Nicholas, I think Adrian went in with the intention to take a life, and I think Anna started to realize that. Either way, police continued in their searches for Anna and Adrian. They announced that Adrian was being charged with an open count of murder, kidnapping, two counts of armed robbery with a deadly weapon, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. After being on the run for several months, however, in December of 2021, Adrian turned himself in to police. At the time, of course, he was taken to jail, and then shortly after, by January of 2022, Anna also decided to turn herself into police and face her charges. She was arrested and charged with an open count of murder, kidnapping, two charges of armed robbery, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy. So that's pretty much where the case sits now. We're still waiting to see if there will be a trial or if they're just going to take a plea deal. As far as I've seen, the other two men that were involved in this are still out there, and I don't think they've been identified. Either Either way, I am so, so very sad about how all of this had to play out. These people literally could have just taken Nicholas's items and his money and just left it at that. They just had to escalate it. They couldn't just rob two people that night of all of their belongings. They had to bring yet another person into it and rob them and then take his life. I know this is a shorter case and the suspects involved have turned themselves in, but when I first heard of this case, I knew that I had to talk about it. Elias died trying to save his brother and that is so admirable to me. He didn't back down to them. He wasn't just going to let them harm his brother because in that instance, you don't know what's going to happen. So I don't want anyone to cast too hard of a judgment on Elias because yes, he did bring another gun into the fight, but they were holding a gun to his brother's head. They made him FaceTime him and show that he was holding a gun to his head. And when he walked out, he saw it for himself. So Elias did what he could to protect his brother. And I find that so admirable. He didn't back down. And for that, he lost his life to a maniac. But the other very sad part about this is that Elias's own brother and his brother's girlfriend watched all of this go down. They watched their loved one being robbed at gunpoint and then their other loved one being shot multiple times and murdered in the middle of the street in front of their family home where they're supposed to feel safe and secure. Elias's mother, Alicia, has come out to talk about how she's very happy that Elias's murderers have decided to take responsibility for what they did. She's happy and confident that justice will be served for her son, which is really nice to see, but obviously she's still absolutely devastated with how all of this happened. So she's been meeting with other families who have also lost loved ones to violence. She just wants to help other families and give them a shoulder to lean on if they need it. She also wants to help others stop all of this unnecessary violence and stop these unnecessary lives being lost. This case is a little bit different than a lot of the cases that I cover on this channel because it truly was a random attack with no real 
original motive. Yes, there was a motive, obviously, to rob Nicholas, but there was no motive to kill Elias. This was completely by chance and completely out of the blue. Nicholas just happened to meet somebody online who he found attractive, and maybe he wanted to start a relationship with her, or maybe he just wanted a girl to hang out with and talk to. But somehow, this all resulted in his brother being murdered, and I can't even imagine the guilt that Nick probably feels every single day. But obviously, he can't blame himself because there's absolutely no way that he could have known all of this would have happened. Either way, as always, my heart goes out to Elias. I am just so sad because he was just starting out in his life. He was excited and he was engaged and he was looking forward to the future, only to have his future ripped away from him for absolutely no reason. Over a thousand dollars. It's absolutely appalling. This case also serves as sort of a lesson to be very careful with who you meet up with when you meet someone online. I feel like in a lot of situations, when a man is going to meet up with a woman, they don't really think that there's a possibility that things could go horribly wrong in this kind of way. It's usually just a thought of like, what if I don't like her? Or what if it's really awkward? Or what if she's weird? Things like that. But I feel like when it's a man going to meet up with another man, or it's a woman, woman meeting up with a man, then there's usually that, you know, caution that you go into it with. It's always, you know, want to make sure my friends have my location. You know, I want to make sure that this person seems normal. You know, I want to protect myself. There's always that little bit of healthy paranoia when going into it. But I feel like in a lot of situations that doesn't happen when you're meeting up with a woman. But clearly women can be just as bad and cause just as much harm. So, no matter your gender, no matter what gender you choose to date or hook up with, please just be careful. You never know who this person is. You never know their true intentions until you actually get to know them and, you know, meet them in person and hang out with them a couple of times. You truly never know who somebody is. No matter if they're really attractive or if they have a baby face like I do or if they just seem really nice or if you've had great conversations, you truly never know somebody. So again, please just be careful when you're meeting up with anybody that you meet online. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. I know this is a topic that I talk about a lot on this channel about, you know, being careful of who you're meeting up with when you meet them online, but this case truly shows that it can be any gender. So I just wanted to make sure that I went ahead and talked about it at the end of this video. But either way, if you liked this video, make sure you go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and go to albert.com slash Rachel Shannon. When you open a bank account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll get $150. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.